a lot of people, you know, get that, get that where uh, it's easy. You know, I just want to quit my job and start a garden and make all this money. And it, it's awesome. It does work, but it's a lot of hard work. Welcome to The Art of Gardening. I'm your host, Melissa Lalo Johnson. And today we are going to be talking about making your dreams a reality, leaving the uh, office environment and starting your own farm and all the ins and outs of that with Tracy Lutz from Summer Pick Farms. Thank you for being here with us today. Well, thank you for having me on the show. That's awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, you're very welcome. And that was one of the things that when we met through Bootstrap Farmer a few years ago, I loved that story. And I love sharing the stories of people that just felt the pull to start the farm life and bring you know their, their produce to market. So can you tell us a little bit about what that transition was like? And what brought you to do that? It wasn't as uh, Instagram perfect as you would think. <laughs> a lot of people, you know, get that get that where uh, it's easy. You know, I just want to quit my job and start a garden and make all this money. And it, it's awesome. It does work, but it's a lot of hard work. Um, it's a lot of stress sometimes. I'm not knocking anybody from it. It's just it's a big transition to do. And and nowadays, I find with our lives the way they are now, where um, you know. We, uh, we spent a lot of money going out to eat or we spent a lot of money just going to the movies or we spent a lot of money with our kids' uh, sports programs or driving new cars or even, you know, with the price of new vehicles nowadays. You know, it's hard to commit yourself to something like this. Um, I'll tell you what, for me anyway, and a lot of my friends that have done this, it's been the best thing we've ever done. Um, do I miss not being in an office? No. Do I miss the people I worked with? Of course I do. I mean, many of those people that I worked with, you know, I worked with for, you know, 14 years. So, you know, I, I do keep up with them. Um, we still are, you know, friends. We still talk and all that stuff like that. But I do miss that camaraderie of, of having someone there to talk to or a workforce uh, to be a part of. But there's nothing better than just being by yourself. I mean, you know, I love... Uh, controlling my day if, if it starts to rain and I don't feel like being outside, guess what? I'm not being outside. So that's the cool part of doing this. Um, like I said, it was a little hard. And and just the number one thing is if I have a great wife, she, uh, Kim is amazing and she is 1000% supportive of, of when I left the uh, workforce and started on her own. Did she think I was a little crazy? Of course she did. I mean, I, I have a lot of crazy ideas. You know, I kind of shoot from the hip at a lot of things. I'm one of those people. And so when I told her this is the road I wanted to go down, she kind of just looked at me a little bit because we've been down this road before with other things. <clears throat> and she said, well, what do you think? Are you really serious? And I said, well, I'm serious. You know, we can do this. I'm totally serious. She said, okay. That's all she said. That was her whole spiel was literally like a 10 second deal. Okay, then we'll make it work. And that's what we've done for the last three years, almost four years now. This year's our fourth year. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely a journey. It's a lot of bumpy, rocky roads. But, you know, I mean, it is passable. I mean, anyone could be doing this. It's not something that you can say, I wish I could do it, but I can't do it. You can do anything you put your mind to. As long as, you, as, long as you're serious about it and you're willing to put the work into it, that's the thing is the work. you got to put sweat equity into anything you do, whether it's your job or, or starting a market farm, you know. Now, what made you want to go to farming specifically? Did you have any prior gardening experience or vegetable growing? Um, not me in general, but my family, yes. You know, my, my uh, grandfather, um, he was a farmer. He was a cattle farmer, but he also had an acre and a half of strawberries every year. So he had, they had a big garden, of course. You know, I'm, I'm going to date myself here, but I'm 50. I just turned 50 a couple months ago. So I am part of that generation where we had victory gardens where we know what a victory garden is. And so I grew up with everybody on our block or everybody in our family had a small garden somewhere. And my grandparents were the same as everyone else. You know, we had an acre and a half garden there with strawberries and corn and others and other stuff like that. And, you know, my mom, um, my mom is Vietnamese. So with that culture, uh, Amy, my mom is huge when it comes to growing flowers and plants and, and vegetables. So we always had a big garden here growing up. So I was always around, you know, growing chickens or, or quail or turkeys or pigs. We had cows and we had horses at one time. I mean, we, we were an all out little farm here, but yeah, that, I kind of get that green thumb, I think from my grandfather and my mom for sure. And, um, it's just something that I find very relaxing. Well, just like what you would be with your lawn. I mean, 
I mean, I watched some of the Instagram posts that you put up and stuff, and it just blows my mind how beautiful your grass is. And it's just like, God, I wish I could get my grass to look that, you know, that that green or the stripes perfect and stuff in your yard. You know, I, it just blows my mind how people do that. But yeah, I think, but you got to have some type of, not a background, that's a bad word to say, but you got to have some type of, of drive, you know, to, to get you there, to make you succeed. Sure. Now, how many acres is your farm? Um, it's small. We only have five acres here. Um, but literally, we're only market gardening on less than a half acre. And with that half acre, you know, I, I, I've got three high tunnels on a half acre. And we also have a 30 by 100. So we have another 3,000 square foot bed outside. So I have three high tunnels and then one 30 by 100 square foot bed outside for um, like our late, our summer stuff, like, you know, like peppers, stuff like that that we put outside. Now we've bounced over the years, a lot of ideas off each other. And definitely I, when I was having a lot of trouble with the thrips, I called you and then subsequently you had an issue with the thrips, which I definitely want to talk about that too, because it's definitely for me, uh, getting that to be under control. And one of the things that we just recently talked about was, um, when I was telling you that Petro tools was going to offer you a product which actually we could get to that right now because it's going to feed right into what we're talking about. You had said, I'm specifically looking for something that will feed my drip irrigation, which is now something this year I've never fed my drip irrigation. It's always been just, um, you know, just water. And then I've water. done the top treat, you know, like the, the ground, the drenches and the foliers right. and all that. Um, but now specifically I'm getting into my irrigation system is now going on probably about nine, 10 years old. And so this year I need to really do a good job of flushing the lines, um, which we're going to go through, touch on that a little bit, but flushing the lines out, getting all the sediment and anything out of the lines, making sure the because I've noticed in the last few years, I've had some areas of the yard where plants are dying, where there are yeah. big plants that are just dead. <laughs> Uh, because they're not getting watered properly. So in researching that, I need to be flushing these lines. So um, in doing that, we're basically just pressurizing your system, which means we're turning it on. And then um, after that is done, you're going to open the end valve of the drip line and let it flush through until it comes out clear. So this yeah, is your main, yeah. the main line. And then you're doing your subline, right? So yep. then you're going to flush yep. you're your subline. Your actual... Your actual uh your actual half inch drip lines itself. Okay. So then you're flushing those until again, they run clear. Um, yeah. And then at that point, I'm now interested in learning about how you're facilitating getting these nutrients into your drip line, because that would be unbelievable. So for the products, yeah. um, a couple things I have here to introduce uh, drought armor, which is made of humic acids. So this okay. stuff is great for breaking down clay and getting those acids into the soil to help it aerate um, and be able okay. to retain nutrients, um, uptake for your plants, all that good stuff. The fabulous warm tea, which we know I'm a huge proponent of. I uh, yeah. love it for soil. <laughs> this is specifically for your soil conditioning to be able to get the micronutrients um, into your soil to be able to have healthy soil for your plants to be able to grow. Or I think I know the answer to this, um, vegetable fertilizer. Yes. <laughs> So that's the big one. This vegetable fertilizer is made of American fish, corn, and seaweed. So all of these nutrients combined together, uh, compost into a really organic, rich nutrient feed for your plants. And yes, this can be put through your drip line, um, yep. organic, the whole fun thing uh, with that. So yeah, so um, we're going to send that out to you. And would well, love thank to, you. Yeah, I would love to see what your, um, you know, how your, what your experience is with it. So definitely keep us posted on that. So going back into irrigation, I'm going to flush my irrigation. In fact, I'm going to do that today. Um, after that's done, what kind of setup do you have to have to get nutrients to your drip irrigation? You just needed some type of injector. Um, the easiest thing to do, and that probably. You could build your own. You could a la carte the parts on Amazon, of course. You know, there's you could DIY anything. You can bootstrap anything you want. I find the easiest thing to do for less than $100 is to buy what they call the Easy Flow Injector. And it's basically, a, uh, I had one over there, but it's outside now. But what it basically is, is a three-quarter or a two-gallon PVC-style tank with a cap and a lid that screws on it and two hoses off of it. So all this does is it has a brass nozzle that, goes in line of your garden hose, whether it's a garden hose or three-quarter irrigation pipe, whichever has a garden hose fitting on it. 
And all that does is once you mix, once you find out, the key is to find out exactly what you need for your bed. So you need to do a little bit of math and see how much square footage of beds that you have that you're trying to inject. And then just follow the rules on the back of the package. I'm sure on the back of that package it will tell you, hey, so many ounces per 100 square feet of, of space you're trying to inject. Uh, just for instance, if you're trying to do a 50-foot bed and I do 30 30 inches across, so I just do easy math and I make it at 36. So you're looking at, I think it's uh, I think it's four ounces or six ounces of the product that I currently am using per bed space. And I know I'm doing 10 beds, so I just kind of do the, the easy cheeky math and I'm like, all right, let's say 40, 50 ounces of product. And then you fill the rest with water. And then all you do is just set it and forget it. It's the whole Ron Papil thing. You just turn the valve and you set a timer on your watch or on your phone. That's what I do. Um, but I did cheat this year and I do have digital timers now. So that does help. So when I'm mowing or I'm working with the chickens or I'm doing other projects in the garage, I don't have to remember, oh, I need to set my drip for an hour and a half today. And, you know, I could just do it with a digital timer and you can spend as much or as less money as you want on those timers. Of course, there's a lot of manual turn timers that just click and do it. I prefer to spend like 50 bucks and just get a good digital timer. And then uh, the one I have actually has two zones on it. So I can do a zone one and zone two. So I set one tunnel at a certain time. And then when this one clicks off, the other tunnel comes on right after it. And it runs through the same injector by just turning a valve. That's the easiest, peasiest thing you can do is uh, it's just what I recommend is what this is not what I did. But this is what I recommend now when I tell when people ask me, just take a piece of paper. Generically, write down your garden beds and keep an idea of, okay, how many row feet do I have of tape? Because that's going to be important when you order your system. How much tape? Am I doing a couple hundred feet of tape or am I doing 5,000 feet of tape? You know, your, your water pressure is going to dictate what you can and cannot do where you live. So as long as you know you've got good water pressure, everything else is just a piece of cake. Just writing it on a piece of paper how many beds I need, what zones I have, what I need to set up, and then buy your drip. Uh, um, materials as needed. But I do recommend try not to a la carte all your drip pieces because some pieces only work with certain equipment. Mm -hmm. I recommend finding a reparable drip irrigation dealer. Um, the one that I use is amazing and they have kits, everything from the small backyard gardener, which is less than $100, all the way up to the complete 100 acre vegetable gardener with a tractor farm. So they do everything in between also. And they do have kits that you could buy for certain price points for certain bed points. Like if you wanted to do 10 100 foot beds, it's got everything you need in that kit to successfully set up your drip irrigation for your farm at that point. Or if you want to do like with me, I added more stuff. So I just called them and told them what I was doing. And then they recommended pieces a la carte to match the system that I have to make everything work where I'm at. How long have you been doing the watering by injector? When did that start for four years? Four years. Wow. I started it right off the get go. Wow. There was two things I wanted to do when we started this. One was get a tunnel. That was the first thing I wanted was at least one tunnel to grow particular crops under to be successful. And the second thing was watering. Um, I think, and, and not saying that you couldn't just jump into market farming for a couple hundred dollars, you can. It just depends what your setup is. I'm a big believer on doing it right the first time and not have to backtrack. You end up spending so much more money if you have to backtrack to fix problems that you started a year ago because you were trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. You know, I understand not everybody has money. I didn't have money. When we started this farm, this farm had to be 100% debt free for me to leave work. That was the goal I gave myself. Um, and all the money, that's why it's taken us four years to get where we're at. You know, some people, you know, you could go to the bank and borrow money. You could have money already saved up. You could have a 401k. This could be your retirement plan. You could do all, there's all kinds of things um, to buy products that you need to get started. We didn't have anything. When we decided to do this, I had zero tunnels, zero anything. All I had was a garden hose and a couple grow bags that we grew tomatoes in on the porch. That's how we started this. And um, so it's taken us four years to get tunnels bought. You know, drip irrigation and a DIY tunnel is the first thing we did here. That was the first thing we did before we put one vegetable in the ground was have those two things bought. Um, and that right there has been a success for us to build off of, to add more items to this. But drip irrigation, um, I think, is besides a, besides a growing space, whether it's a tunnel or a covered porch or, or anything like that, 
is drip irrigation. Watering is the key to making these things grow. Um, you can hand water, of course. You're going to overwater. Anytime you hand water, you're overwatering what it needs. I mean, most of these things, like let's say this little Geronimo tomato plant or this this little cup of basil or anything like that, like a tomato needs, I think they say it needs one gallon of water per week. So, you know, I can adjust my timers by your emitters that you use on your drip irrigation. I know it uses 0 0.20 uh, of a gallon per hour per emitter per every two feet. I know it's, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you. No, but then I know, okay, if I water twice a week for this length of time, I will get almost a gallon of water per plant per week into the soil. So I'm not just taking a gallon watering can and just dumping a gallon of water on this tomato plant. God forbid you're drowning it, you know, just one time a week I'm doing it. I can set this and tailor this to an hour every day, 30 minutes every day. I could run my drip 30 minutes every day to get to that one gallon per week per plant that, that my goal is. Or I, I do it twice a week. That way I give it a break, come back and water it, give it a break. And that seems to let the soil do its thing. You know, if you overwater too much by overhead watering, uh, you actually compact that soil. So what you're doing with compaction is you're not allowing air to get in there. So your soil's going hydrophobic because the top layer, you can when you can dump water on it, it just literally just runs off that soil, you know that you're hydrophobic. You're not getting any of that moisture down deep to where your roots are. Um, so anytime you use any type of drip system, you're actually putting that water where it needs to go. It needs to go at the base of that plant or pretty much close to the base of that plant. And you can now regulate mother nature. Mother nature does not regulate you. So we're in the Midwest, you're in Kansas. Um, I'm in mm -hmm. Missouri. We're a couple hours apart. Um, yep. So you are watering right now. What's your timing look like comp compared to what you're doing in the summer? Um, I water once a week now. And I spot water at that point because um, in my big tunnel <clears throat> where I've got all my, I've got half of my tomatoes are out in that tunnel and cucumbers right now. I'll spot water that. I usually water once every other day, about an hour at a time through my drip. Now, I, I kind of go through and do the whole stick your finger in the whole thing, kind of test it out and make sure where I'm at because with the tunnel, it actually heats up a little more. So on our days where it's, where we have bluebird, like right now we have bluebird sky outside. So it's only going to be high of high 50s today. That tunnel will be almost 100 degrees today, even wide open. Yeah. And so even in the wintertime, when it is 10, 20 degrees, as long as it's bluebird sky, it'll be 50 in there in the middle of December or January. So, you know, the, the plants are still growing in their little culture there. So you still have to water. You just slow it down in the winter and you speed it up in the summer. So right now I'm spot watering once a week, roughly. And if I think it needs a little more, I may do it twice a week, but do the first watering um, at an hour and then the second watering, maybe at 30 minutes, something like that. I'll kind of play with the time and then I'll go through and check the soil the next day and see how wet it is. I mean, that's your key. I mean, you always want to be observing what's going on um, with your soil and your plants, because they'll tell you the story. I mean, they're like a person. If a person's sick, you know when someone's sick. You can tell when you're around somebody enough when they're sick. Same thing with a plant. You can look at a plant, you know, and tell, hey, you know, like this basil, okay, well, the leaves are a little bit yellow. Maybe it needs a little fertilizer. Maybe it needs a little water. Maybe it's too much fertilizer. Maybe it's too much water. You know, you can kind of narrow it down to where you need to be to fix your situation. As the summer rolls in, I'll ramp that up to twice a day at like three hours a day of watering. So I'll start small and then my plants will tell me, hey, back off the watering a little bit. We're cool. And then I'll back it off to maybe 45 minutes a drip or 30 minutes a drip. And then if it seems like I like to I like to push things a lot. So with my fertilizer, I like to just I like to bam it to them first thing going in. So you know, I'll maybe over fertilize a little bit and let them tell me what they want. They may be like, yeah, bring it to me, you know, throw it in. And I'll just start adding a little more until they back, until I know to back off a little bit. It's, it's kind of a, the, to me, what I find out is you kind of have to play for it yourself because everybody's different. You know, where we're at right here, you know, we're in Kansas, you know, you're in Missouri. We're basically, you know, we're like an hour and a half from each other. So we're going to be different than people that are in Tennessee or Georgia or people that are in Arizona or California watering, you know? So you kind of have to know your region and know your area to what you can and cannot do, but uh, don't be afraid. I mean, that's one thing. This is gardening. This isn't, you know, don't be afraid of trying something new or going outside the box or just breaking the norm and trying something new. I mean, you're never going to know 
topping a tomato plant is going to work unless you top it. You know, it sounds scary, but people do it all the time, you know, mm -hmm. or topping your lemongrass or topping, you know, basil, you know, I, you know, it, it wasn't until two years ago, I figured out I could just top basil and do different things and get a bigger plant. You know, I was always scared. You look at this beautiful thing and you're like, Oh my God, I don't want to do this. Just do it. You know, you're not hurting anything. And it's so what if it doesn't work? You just do something else. You know, I mean, that that's all you've got to do. I mean, there's nothing, there's no harming in, in testing the waters, you know? Sure. Well, I want to give a shout out to our friends at Bootstrap Farmer also, because I know they've been in, instrumental in um, kind of getting you up and going. And I know yeah, they've been amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> I know that you use their high tunnels, you use their trays, their seed starting. So yep. tell us a little bit about your hoop house that you started with them and what do you grow in it? Uh, well, like I said, I started with, with a simple DIY tunnel, which is a kit that they provide the important bits to you, uh, like the brackets you need, any type of off the shelf or not off the shelf stuff that you can get. And then you go out and purchase your own poles, bend them yourself, put them together with their instruction, put them in the ground, start growing. It's just simple as that. Um, a lot of people, you know, uh, will say, well, I, I can't do that by myself. Yes, you can. I mean, a hundred percent. Yes, you can. Um, if you're any type of mechanically ability, even if you're not, you can put these together. The instructions are so well and written so well in this. Anyone could do this. Um, you know, yes, I did have help on certain items. We're putting a plastic on. You definitely want to have help on because that is one giant sail or a kite. You know how we are here in the Midwest. We get 60, 70 mile an hour gusts just out of the blue for no reason. The last thing you want is a 40 by 120 piece of plastic carrying you off, you know, <laughs> out of the county there. <laughs> so you definitely want to have help on certain things, but you can build these by yourself. Um, it's been the best thing ever. Um, you can shade when you want to shade. You can grow when you want to grow. Keep the pests out when you want to. Let them in when you want to. Um, you know, we're a deep compost mulch system. I'm not... I, I'm not a no-till guy. I'm not a till guy. I'm a get it done guy. That's how my farm is. I just get it done. Whatever I need to do to get the job done, whether that's firing up a tiller, breaking new ground, or readjusting my garden beds, or dumping buckets of compost on something and not touching that bed again with a tiller. You just got to do what you got to do to make it work. But a high tunnel is the first start to that. So it's been amazing to protect everything from Mother Nature. You know, you are now, once you get a high tunnel, you are Mother Nature. You're the person caring for those plants in that in the ground there. So everything you do is dictated by you now. The sun, the shade, the water, the wind, everything that you're dictating. So um, I highly recommend high tunnels. It's Whether it's a, a 20 by 20 high tunnel or 20 by 100s that we use, um, you know, everybody's on a different platform of what they're growing and their abilities are. But man, it's so nice to go in there and start your tomatoes in March you know, here in Kansas versus, you know, when, uh, when people don't get their tomatoes in the ground till mid May here because of the frost, you know? So it's so awesome to extend your season, um, and to start your season early. You know, I mean, we talk about it all the time, you know, that you get, you get in that funk, that gardening funk where the end of season comes and you're like, Oh, thank Lord. The end of seasoning's here. I can take a break. And then you're, and then five minutes later, your anxiety kicks in. You're like, I need to start seeds, sure. <laughs> you know, and then you're just like every, every week I'm looking at my seeds. I'm like, all right, I need to order seeds. I need to order my seeds. January comes, all right, I need to start tomatoes. Wait, no, I don't. Okay. This is stupid. Why am I starting tomatoes in January? You know, I mean, you get to that little funk, but that high tunnel kind of helps you extend that season. You know, you can throw a lot of brassicas, a lot of lettuces that we do in the fall, you know, carrots. There's nothing better than wintertime carrots. So, you know, you throw anything like that in there, you know, and that literally while you're looking outside and there's a foot and a half of snow outside, you know, your high tunnels just, you know, zooming along with, with fresh produce every day. You know, it is your backyard grocery store. So, mm -hmm. you know, tunnels are, are probably one of the most amazing things to have on your farm to start off with. That's great. So tell us a little bit about, um, we're running close on time here. Tell us about. Yeah, I know. Decided... I like to talk. <laughs> no, you're fine. Tell us about when you decided to take your products to market. What did that look like? How long after you started were you able to start doing the farmers markets? And tell us about that. We started. We started in the first year. Um, everything we grew is it, it's kind of a hit and miss. It's going to be in your area what people like and what they don't like. Uh, a lot of people like 
um, we'll talk about fancy heirloom tomatoes and stuff. Like we found out in our area, nobody wants to buy those type of heirloom tomatoes. We could we grew a lot of Cherokee purples and a lot of brandy wines. We couldn't even give them away. Nobody wanted them. They wanted a plain red slicing tomato because that's where we're at. We're meat potatoes Midwest here. So people don't like to fare too far away from that type of thing. So you've got to know your region where you're growing. Um, the first six months, eight months of the year, our first really growing year, we didn't sell anything at market. We knew going in that this was going to be a loss of money going into this because that's how our model was. That's how I wrote our business model up was I didn't want to start making money until year two or three because that way I could fine tune. I didn't want to put a product that was mediocre on the market and then everybody would know that Tracy's product from Summer Picks Farms was, eh, it was okay. You know, I, di I didn't want that. I wanted it to be a product where people were like, that's the guy we need to go buy our stuff from. That's my salad guy right there. That's the guy we buy all of our salad from. That's who I wanted to be. Um, so I needed to perfect my craft. So it, I was willing to take a hit our first year, year and a half, uh, on knowing we probably weren't going to make a lot of money doing this. We weren't going to break even doing this, you know, because your first year is where you're buying everything. You're buying your seeds and your seed starting mix and all your pots and everything you need to do to make this happen. Um on a big scale, like what we were projecting on. So, you know, of course there was a lot of money spent on a lot of those type of products like that. Uh, but after that, it was basically listening to my friends and family. They were telling me what they wanted. They were telling me that they wanted big red slicers. They were telling me that they wanted juicy, uh, dark green cucumbers. They were telling me that they didn't want, um, this certain type of, a variety of something. They wanted this type of stuff. So you listen to your, you, you listen to your, your base and then you go from there. Um, we've been doing farmers markets last year. We did three farmers markets a week. That right there will wear you out. <laughs> so we cut back on one. So we are doing currently two farmers markets a week, one on Saturday and one on Thursday in different towns. Uh, that way we, we do one in Lawrence on Thursday night, which is kind of like a laid back, um, uh, block party kind of style. You know, you get, you get, uh, you get the beer trucks down there, you get some live music, you get people sitting around eating at food trucks and then walking through. And then we do one on Saturday, of course, here in Topeka, that um, it's more of your traditional style, you know, 60, 70 vendor farmer's market. So um, yeah, it, it takes a little bit to get there, but as it is with flower farming or vegetable growing or anything like that, it's kind of the same. You just kind of need to know your market uh, and then kind of adjust to make money in that market. You know, there's money to be made in all this. Uh, you just have to figure out what your, what your clientele wants, you know? What do you think of everything that you sell? What do you think you sell the most of? Uh, salad mix and green beans. I cannot grow, you know, we'll grow 3,500 heads of lettuce here throughout this, the, the tunnels. I'll have four or five beds. You know, if you do four or five beds, three across seven inch spacing, you know, I could put 250 heads of lettuce in each bed and then we do four or five beds. You know, now you're looking at 12, 1300 head, um, green beans. Uh, it's, it's crazy how fresh green beans are wild here. Um, we, we usually grow two or 300 plants of green beans at a succession. So I'll start 200 at one time and then I'll break it up and then we'll do 200 plants throughout the week. We've gone with hundred pounds of green beans before at the market and sold out. That's how, much wow. fresh green beans so it's crazy and then tomatoes will be okay but then like some other stuff won't be but then salad mix is what i'm known for so it's like you know we grow of course we got the salad novas we grow all the big head lettuces we grow all the wildfire johnny's mix we grow asian tot soy mix we grow uh big leaf spinach and we grow all that that's the kind of stuff that a lot of people will will buy from us because you can't that's the stuff you can't get in the store you know, it's, it's hard. You can get iceberg kind of style bags of mixes. You can get all kinds of stuff like that, but there's nothing better than something that was picked less than 24 hours before you're taking it and feeding your family. With that it. is the truth. Tell us about, um, what's coming up next. What's next for summer pick farms? Oh, uh, what's next? Well, I would like to add another, I know this sounds weird, but we're looking at adding another three to four more tunnels. Um, possibly moving. We thought about moving to a bigger place um, where we could actually lay the farm out a little different the way I want to do it. There's there's a lot of things that have been kicked around uh, farm to table. So we actually talked about uh, 
Uh, I don't know if it's going to be here where we're at. It may be at another farm that we're trying to look into. I've got uh, a buddy that wants to be involved in this but doesn't want to be involved, but he would love to do a farm-to-table restaurant with our name. So it'd be something where, you know, the farm is producing for a farm-to-table style event or farm-to-table here at the farm. It just depends. Um, my goal is to have a farm stand. I say farm stand, but more like a farm store where people can come where we will have, you know, where you can walk the tunnels, you could see the food being grown, and then you could stop by and get a salad or, or a good grilled chicken sandwich or something like that at the restaurant. You know, there, everything's all in one spot. So while you're sitting at the restaurant, you know, ordering your lunch for the day, and you're looking outside the window, you can actually see people working in the high tunnels, growing the product that you're eating at that table for lunch. You know, that's a goal of ours. Whether that will ever come about, who knows? You know, but um, but that's something we're looking forward to in our five to ten year goal. Um, that's where we want to be. So hopefully we can get there. That's a lot of time, a lot of stress and a lot of money to get there. But hopefully um, the stars are aligned and everything will work out. and We'll be able to get there. But if not, you know. I'll just still be growing in high tunnels doing what I do. For sure. Well, I mean, I met you, it was the beginning of COVID. I think it was. Yeah. Like right, yeah, right before was happening. that. Like right before. All right that before. Launched. Yeah. So, I mean, and just to see, and that was when you were just getting started. You guys were just getting yeah. going with everything. And I mean, so to see, yeah. I'm just so proud of you guys and so happy for you and Kim, because look at how far you've come. You. you know, it's exciting to see what you'll be doing in the next three years, four years. Um, down the line. So if you'd like to learn more about Tracy Lutz and Summer Pick Farms, you can look him up on Instagram. He's also got an amazing YouTube channel that does a lot of different tutorials and how to's and shows you more about his lifestyle and the hoop houses and everything that he's growing. Do you have anything, any final words for us, Tracy? Just, I uh, just want to thank you for letting me be on the podcast today. It was pretty amazing. I love you, Melissa. You know that we've oh, been I'll friends for couple of years now we talk all the time um and when we're both kind of it's, it's easy to talk to somebody that's like-minded views so it's easier for us just to bounce like I said we bounce stuff off whether it's bugs or just yeah. life in general so it's amazing to have you as a friend um just get out there and grow something like i said you can't screw this up trust me you I, if it has i have screwed it up <laughs> so but yeah you cannot screw gardening up just get out there get your hands in the dirt that's the best kind of therapy for everybody Absolutely. just get your hands Absolutely. Yep. Many, many failures lead to many successes. So exactly. Thanks again for being with us today. And uh, you have such a great energy. I always love talking to you. Um, we'll definitely have to have you on again soon as the season picks yep. up and um, check out more Art of Gardening on the Art of Gardening channel that is through Petra Tools on YouTube. And um, yeah, thanks so much for being with us and we will see you again soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye. See ya.